This is Matthew Cratter from Bitcoin University. And today I wanted to talk a little bit more about Bitcoin ordinals, inscriptions, and what I'm calling prime real estate. I've covered this in a, pr a few previous videos. The first one was about whether ordinals and NFTs will destroy Bitcoin. And in that video, I talked about the two really strong traditions in Bitcoin culture. First one is don't shovel unrelated crap into the Bitcoin blockchain. Keep the blockchain as small as possible to make it easier for everyone in the world to run a node, which helps to keep Bitcoin decentralized. And then the second strong and somewhat conflicting tradition in this case was allow everyone to use Bitcoin as they see fit. It's an open and permissionless system. I did a follow-up video where I tried to steel man the arguments in favor of ordinals and inscriptions and NFTs on Bitcoin, and my conclusion that adding inscriptions to the Bitcoin blockchain might be a good way of preserving documents or images in a way that cannot be censored or edited in a way that's completely globally distributed. So I want to talk a little bit more about this, and the metaphor I came up with today was that Bitcoin block space is prime real estate. So why wouldn't people be willing to pay a lot of money in transaction fees to be able to embed something, a text, an image, a video on the world's preeminent blockchain? If you're an artist, for example, would you rather have your art displayed at the world's smallest art gallery, Hera Gallery, or would you prefer to have it displayed at the Museum of Modern Art, the, the MoMA? If you're an NFT artist, would you prefer to use Ethereum where most NFTs just point to a file that lives outside the blockchain on a regular server or on what's called IPFS, which stands for Interplanetary File System. It's another way of using servers. Or would you prefer to be able to embed your NFT directly in the blockchain, in the Bitcoin blockchain, as you can do with Bitcoin NFTs? Furthermore, if you would like a file to still be accessible in 200 years from now, would you store it on in the Apple iCloud, Google Cloud Services, or the Bitcoin blockchain. If you would like to post a file for all the world to see, and you'd like to ensure that it's never censored, would you store it in the iCloud, Google Cloud, or Bitcoin blockchain? The obvious answer in this case is Bitcoin blockchain. We can be reasonably sure that it's gonna be around and there will be copies of it available all around the world, unlike Apple and Google, which are decentralized services. So this leads to the question, is this a, mis a misuse of Bitcoin? block space. To answer that question, it may come down to making a moral judgment, which in the case of software protocols, I think we should try to avoid. Ordinals and inscriptions do not violate any Bitcoin consensus rules. You can't say that you're in favor of an open and permissionless network and then say in the same breath that you want to censor certain transactions. I think censorship like this is a very slippery slope indeed, and we certainly don't want to set up a centralized censor who will censor uh, Bitcoin transactions that we don't like. In this case, it's also probably impossible, and we touched on this in a past video, but I want to bring it forward for people who haven't seen it. As far as I can tell, there is no way to censor Bitcoin inscriptions like Bitcoin NFTs, BRC20 tokens, which are just ship coins issued on, on the Bitcoin uh, blockchain itself. There's this quote from Andrew Polstra, who currently works for Blockstream, very good programmer, has worked on Bitcoin Core, very smart guy. And I keep coming back to his, uh, his Bitcoin dev post here. And this is Andrew speaking. Unfortunately, as near as I can tell, let's go over here. Unfortunately, as near as I can tell, there's no sensible way to prevent people from storing arbitrary data in witnesses without incentivizing even worse behavior and or breaking legitimate use cases. If we ban quote unquote useless data like inscriptions, for example, then it would be easy for would-be data stores to instead embed their data inside of useful quote unquote useful data, such as dummy signatures or public keys, Doing so would incur a, uh, an approximately 2x cost to them. But if 2x, in other words, 2x in terms of transaction fees is enough to dis disincentivize storage, then there's no need to have this discussion because they will be forced to stop due to fee market competition. Anyway, I think this is a really good point. Now, here's the good news. I still believe that non-financial uses of Bitcoin block space will almost certainly get priced out by financial uses of Bitcoin block space over time, using Bitcoin as money. Bitcoin as freedom money for the world will continue to be the primary use case for the Bitcoin blockchain as it has been for the past 14 years. People who talk about, sometimes I see in my comment section, people want to roll back upgrades like SegWit or Taproot in an effort to stop inscriptions, I think are missing the forest for the trees because the worst thing that you can do with Bitcoin is to try to keep fixing things by suggesting changes to the code. SegWit and Taproot were both updates that were a long time coming and they were widely accepted. Otherwise, they would not have happened. So I think just because fees are spiking and they have come down quite a bit 
uh, over the past few weeks. But just because fees are spiking, I don't think we should make rushes to try to try to change the code. Are fees too low? Don't try to fix this by changing the code. Are transaction fees too high? Don't try to fix this by changing the code. Bitcoin is this dynamic system of incentives and different equilibria. And so the less that we change the code, the more we can allow Bitcoin itself to adapt to market pressures. This was something interesting that happened in the wake of the fee spike of the past few weeks. We've seen high fees, high transaction fee, fees, incentivizing development and use of layer two solutions like Lightning. We are see, we've seen that Coinbase is now going to finally, after all these years, integrate the Bitcoin Lightning network into, an, into its exchange for withdrawals, presumably, and the same for Binance in an effort to find a, a way for people to withdraw their Bitcoin from these exchanges without having to pay high fees on the base layer when they're high fees. In other words, giving people this option. So this is one of the nice things about higher transaction fees at the base layer. It is pushing development to layer two and to side chains. If we cannot ban inscriptions, as Andrew Polster suggests, and if he's right about this, I would suggest that we might as well just suggest some good use cases for them besides issuing crappy NFTs or BRC20 ship coins. And I think Eric Kaysen has some interesting uh, ideas in this tweet thread. He says, uh, this is on May 27th, we can now document genocide, crimes against humanity, and preserve the most important documents and literature of the human race before everything is modified by the global panopticon, in other words, a global surveillance system and state AI propaganda machine. And then furthermore, real-time organizations and communication can be done directly on the time chain, which is what he's calling the blockchain, which under conditions of war, war, it can become one of the only tools that can allow for one to communicate. So these are two interesting use cases. Finally, Eric's working on something he calls the Library of Satoshis. It's an inscription project that will have the 10,000 most important works of humanity put on the time chain, put on the blockchain directly. The importance of this far outweighs a short-term increase in transaction costs. So again, you may agree or disagree with these usages of the Bitcoin block space, but it is prime real estate. People can use it as they see fit. And I don't think this is something to worry about. I think we should trust the transaction market, this free, uh, the transaction fee market to sort things out and things will eventually be priced where they should be. And I think the biggest mistake we can make is panicking and calling for rolling back uh, Taproot or SegWit or something like this. There's always the law of unintended consequences when you introduce an upgrade, but Taproot was a widely accepted upgrade and it made many very interesting things possible as well. If you found this video helpful, be sure to hit that subscribe and like button. Hit the notification bell if you want to be notified when I publish my next video. And let me know your questions and comments in the comment section below. Thanks all for watching and I'll see you in the next video.